Hello and welcome to IR Thinker, where international affairs are discussed. Today we are having a very special edition with five experts, five future experts, five students, and we're going to speak about Russian and Iranian relations. We're going to touch a very interesting topic of Iranian drones being used in the war in Ukraine. And I would like to know what students think about it. I would like to delve deeper into the thoughts how international relations are understood by students. So let's introduce ourselves. Uh, you already know me, I'm Martin Zubko, and this is the IR Thinker podcast. And let's start with Igor. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Martin, for the invitation. Uh, my name is Igor, Igor Sorov. I'm a master's student of African studies at the University of Radetz uh, Karlova in the Czech Republic. I got my bachelor in uh, international relations with focus on area studies, United States and the United Kingdom, with a focus on US foreign policy in the Middle East. I'm engaged in human rights, and today I'm happy to share a couple of thoughts and insights into the topic of Iranian uh, Russian cooperation and drones. Thanks, Mikhail. Um, hi, everyone. Hi, Martin. Thanks for inviting. Um, I'm a graduate student um, at the Walsh School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University. So I'm based in Washington, D.C. right now. And I also am a part-time um, graduate student assistant at a Russian Matters Project at Harvard. Aryan? Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'm Aryan. I'm studying philosophy, politics, economics here in Charles University, and I'm from Iran. So... I've been growing up with these news. Thank you. Juan? Hello. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, my name is Juan Francisco. I'm a master, uh, master's study, master's student in uh, geopolitical studies. And with, uh, with my colleague, Ronan, who we'll talk a little bit later, uh, we also started a podcast program, which is called The Geopolitical People. Uh, the Geopolitical People. Well, we also uh, publish information uh, on a weekly basis on uh, topics related with international security, with international relations, and with geopolitics. Ron? Thanks very much, Martin, and thanks for having me on the show. Um, so I'm, I'm originally from Australia. I also obviously did a master's in geopolitical studies at Charles University. We have the podcast together. I finished my master's about a year ago, and now I'm working with the university as part of the geopolitics department, working on the uh, outreach program to Africa, and also work for a geopolitical analysis and forecasting company called Geopolitical Futures as the analyst that specializes in sub-Saharan Africa, generally, generally, and I guess a bit of Asia-Pacific surrounding Australia as well. So, Perfect. Thank you very much. So we have a variety of students, nationalities, and we also have a good topic. And let's start with the first uh, topic or, or first section of, of this podcast. And that's the Russian-Iranian military cooperation. I have a few notes about it. In 1979, Moscow sent less than 1 million worth of weapons to Tehran. Russia then backed Iraq during the eight-year war with Iran. In 1991, Russian arms sales to Iran of bombers, tanks, and submarines reach around $772 million. However, during 1995 and 2000, Moscow and Washington worked together and they seized the sales of arms to Iran, so that was almost non-visible one. In 2005, however, the transfer of the weapons to Iran fell to only 15 million. In 2006, it jumped again to 368 million because Iran bought air defense system. Then, in 2016, the import from Russia was around 400 million dollars. But this number again dropped to around 3 million or less through the years to 2020. And there are three implications I would like to underline. The first one, how this cooperation in a military sphere evolve despite Russia backing Iraq. That's quite interesting. Then we have the interesting implication 
of Russia being accused of low quality of the Russian weapons. And Iranians, they were looking to copy the Western technologies and a little bit, you know, with the international reach. So, so they were questioning the quality and the effectiveness of the Russian weapons. And the third one is the different geopolitical interest. Many people think that Iran and Russia, they are always together, always supporting each other. But when you delve deeper into this topic, you see that Russia and Iran, they have different geopolitical interests. Sometimes that interest is mutual, but many times it's, it's very different, especially when you study Israel and the Middle East. And that's the question for you, students. How do you understand the Russian-Iranian military cooperation? And what are your thoughts after studying particular sections, either in your international relations studies or master degrees or, you know, as, as a hobby topic? So I would like to know your thoughts based on this text, which goes, you know, from zero, then the sale jump to a few billions, basically, and then it again incline. So, so what is it? Why, why Russia and Iran are cooperating in military sphere? And what do you think about it? Let's start with Mikhail. Uh, yeah, thanks, Martin. Um, I wanted to jump on your third point um, about the geopolitical implications. And, you know, it is usually presented that Russia and Iran are strategic allies. Um, and I don't want to diminish that, you know, don't want to diminish that argument. Um, but in many ways, Russian-Iranian relations were transactional. Um, although they publicly aligned themselves in anti-Western rhetoric and general anti-Western agenda, um, Russia has always been using Iran as a proxy to either enter the Middle East or influence Middle Eastern actors to put pressure on them and um, use Iran as a leverage because Iran was capable and willing to use um, more violent means or more questionable means um, of exercising, you know, um, coercive power in the Middle East. Especially this is seen in um, Syria, where Russian-Iranian relations were a little volatile. Um, and um, from the very beginning, Moscow was not super happy with um, Tehran being gaining influence. And now it's kind of this push-pull dynamic there that is most prevalent um, in the Syrian conflict. Okay. Boys, next one. You can you can speak freely. I, there is no particular order, so feel free. I would like I to mention just, one uh, thing. Um, uh, sorry, Igor. <laughs> no, I would just like to mention one thing, and it's uh, how maybe nowadays, uh, especially after the invasion the invasion of Ukraine, uh, this relationship between Iran and Russia has to be kept by both, uh, even in a deeper uh, way than before. Um, obviously, you can see, or from the geopolitical perspective, you can see Russia and Iran as uh, competitors in the Middle East uh, to try and find their, their own sphere of influence and so on. However, nowadays, uh, they're both uh, countries that are uh, touched by similar sanctions. They're both countries that have to circum circumnavigate both the region and the international trade uh, and so they can be much more helpful to each other. At this point, uh, um, we can say, I would agree with, um, with Mikhail that it's like uh, this evolution, no? But I'd say that nowadays, we, what we are seeing is the, what we would we see even in the, in the near future is uh, even much closer relation just because uh, you're running out of other options to, to trade and to, and to basically uh, have international relations with them. I would like to uh, add a couple of thoughts to the Michael's point and uh, to Juan Frey's points uh, about the transactional nature of Russian-Iranian relations. Um, and I would stay uh, very cautious uh, to uh, read to uh, when you, when we read the headlines of um, arranged marriage of Russia and Iran of or even of the plans that these two countries are forging a military alliance, because this is uh, against the nature of how these relations of these two countries developed continuously over time. Martin mentioned that in 2006, the uh, arms sales skyrocketed of uh, uh, Russia. Iran back then bought uh, S-300 
missiles from Russia, but <laughs> surprisingly, they haven't been delivered in the next uh, six or seven years. So this doesn't really look like um, the marriage type of relationship based on partnership, but of, on serious partnerships. However, in well, that was before I would say before the war, before the war in Ukraine, we could operate in this uh, in this dimension. But now we we see that both Russia and Iran are quite uh, are prisoners of the current geopolitical situations under tremendous Western pressure. And for Russia sees Iran as a gateway, uh, a know-how base of how to make uh, import substitution and reverse engineering work, considering the state of um, arms production or like the international restrictions in the first place. And second of all, it's a broader geopolitical agenda in um, uh, lowering or challenging the US traditional influence in, uh, in the Middle East. We obviously cannot say that uh, Russia will be the substitute of the United States in the Middle East. This is far away from being even 10% real. What is more than real is the uh, complete, um, creation of huge higher level of turbulence in the uh, security paradigm in the Middle East, considering all the proxy engagements of Iran, for instance. And it's very militaristic, continuous rhetoric since 1979. Well, I want to add some few points also. The relationship between Russia and Iran is nothing close to anything equal because Russia is seeing Iran as a some gateway from the current international chaos to find other things and alternatives. But Iran is using Russia mostly to supplement what it needs in the internal issues. So Russia is helping Iran to just to, I mean, by Iran, Islamic Republic, just to keep going and being in the power while Iran is helping Russia to reach whatever it cannot reach right now at the moment. So there is no alliance. And I think the conflict of interest is more than the uh, mutual uh, interest. And in the normal world, these two countries, I don't think that they can have like a agreement on anything. But right now there's no options, especially for Iran, which is a really isolated country and is going to be even more isolated. And about the arm deals, none of them were, happened uh, in a really good way. For example, the most recent one was uh, part of these drones that they were supposed to give some Soho, these fighters. And they ended up just giving some, uh, you know, training of them, you know, not even the real one yet. And, and we know that the Sohos are not the same as, as it used to be now. It's not competitor anymore. So the deal is not going to that way, but I think this is a desperation that is leading both countries towards each other more than anything else. Yeah, I'd just like to add, I think if we look at the relationship, they haven't got a strong historical um, collaborative kind of approach. And so there's not really this built up feel it close relationship between them. And so this, what I see is kind of a bit of a marriage of convenience between them both, because they both, as everyone has pointed out, have been really hard hit by the sanctions. Russia has uh, got no real options for um, getting supplies of artillery shells, drones, as we'll touch on later, I'm sure. Um, and we see actually just recently Kim, Kim Jong-un being invited to Russia as part of them trying to procure additional artillery shells and ammunition. And I think this speaks to like a le level of desperation within Russia. So they're happy to work with anyone. Whereas Iran has been for a long time ostracized by the international community, um, but they're able to get money from this, this transaction, which will allow their internal economic problems to be somewhat addressed. And I think if we look at actually Iran's posturing now, they're not in any way uh, ideologically aligned to Russia. We just see in the last uh, few weeks, the discussions with the US um, about releasing the $6 billion in funding for uh, from South Korea in exchange for prisoner swap, but I, I'm sure there was actually much more back channel discussions going on behind this, which must have been about the supply of weapons to Russia. And I'm sure there would have been some unofficial uh, agreement that this would potentially stop in exchange for a greater support and integration of Iran back into the international community. So I think it's kind of an uneven relationship 
uh, from the start because Russia is coming from a point of desperation and Iran is coming from a point where now they've been able to leverage it to maybe get some more goodwill from the US and then be reintegrated into the the broader ec- international community. Um, yeah, just to... Yeah, sorry, Martin. Um, oh, really quick point. It's, it's good that um, the exchange is supposed to happen today as far as I'm aware. So that's one thing. And the other... Um, to point out that Russia has never had an Iran-centric Middle Eastern policy. Um, it tried to try uh, to be sort of diplomatic power there, being part of uh, negotiations in many conflicts in Yemen. Not for the lack of trying, it diminished its power, but it um, dedicated resources um, to being a mediator state, um, which you know eventually, uh, in many cases, failed. So, um, and in many ways, Russia was cooperating with Western powers. Um, in negotiations with Iran. I mean, JCPOA, Russia was in endorsement of the treaty and or, or the agreement, and it urged Iran not to um, not to cease cooperating uh, within the agreement framework, even after the United States left. So it's a sort of, a, um, as everyone here mentioned, it's a sort of a marriage of convenience where the, um, rather than a strategic partnership for the, for the long run. In fact, I doubt that Russia believes in strategic partnerships for the long run. Um, or has the luxury of having those strategic partnerships. In many ways, uh, when Russia uh, is speaking about strategic partnership, and you have a look at the history, it's like, you know, more narrative than practical steps or pragmatism. For instance, I'm writing a research article about Mongolia, and, and you go through the documents, and it's always strategic, it's always sort of, sort of like high-level talks. But then you ask people, like, what? What are they doing, you know, in Mongolia? What sort of projects we can visit, and what can we see? And and then not much, you know. So so that's also the implication, you know, to take the strategic partnership with moderation. But on the other hand, we see in media that they always argue Russia, Iran, Russia, Iran as as a new threat or or sort of like alliance. So why in media Russia and Iran they have so much space? I mean, I, I think that. Uh, sorry, you go again. <laughs> um, I think that's uh, that. If we're talking about the media, I think it has to go away from from the part, the analytical part, geopolitical part, and so on. My opinion, uh, you have several movements uh, that you can uh, create stories around, and uh, one of those is Russia, and the other one is Iran, and they are close enough to be sharing a sea. And they're close enough to to uh, have uh, the Iranian-made drones in uh, in Ukraine. So that's enough. That's what you need. And uh, it's two enemies of the West uh, that you've been saying that they are enemies of the West for a long time. So I I think they go together hand in hand. Like then, for example, when uh, when Ronald mentioned the the visit of Kim Jong Un to to Russia, I think it goes hand in hand. This uh, it was Syria before, like which you can call it uh, um, the axis of evil, or you can call it uh, however you want to call it, but it's like these entities that in the end you put in the same box, in the same pocket, because it doesn't matter what it is in reality. What matters is that these are the enemy and this is what you put in the media. But that goes, in my opinion, that goes outside from the, the actual geopolitical uh, situation that they may have on how they go together. Uh, I don't think it's, it's the same. Yeah, fair enough. Media can help to facilitate the sort of this discussion within the society and show, right, let's say, guys, we know that these guys and those guys are doing terrible things and we need to counter them. That's why we have the sanctions. That's why we stand for the values. Uh, you know, just the simple rhetoric of uh, so- social mobilization. Because at the end of the day, uh, information that is widely spread uh, through the media, and uh, again, I'm coming back to the loud, um, loud headlines of like military military alliances between uh, Russia and Iran, and uh, of a completely threat to the so-called collective West of a newer scale. Well, there is part of truth in uh, in that stuff. However, uh, media will, will just solely reading the headlines on the topic. To take like any even if you read these things from like five different uh, different outlets you will still not be able to come to anywhere closer to how the things actually work what might be you know better is just to take a look at the academic literature on that topic however here we still have the the issue of uh, having not much information 
like a, it is very diff it was very, very difficult before the war to find any sort of you know uh, ukrainian war and any information on uh significant information on like russian arms exports and imports in numbers and volumes there are some indicators on cipri there are amnesty international is doing some researches but still this doesn't show you the exact picture nowadays we have even less data than uh than before and this might lead us to drawing wrong or inaccurate conclusions that will you know, force us into um, wrong perceptions of how the, na the nature of these current relations are uh, what are, are going, and it might mislead us to you know um, to 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 think what is in fact not uh, uh, in accordance to to the current geopolitical situation, or just simply take the take your focus somewhere elsewhere. Say drones. It's a great headline word that uh, there is a drone factory. Sure, but uh, the more, most importantly is what is behind that drone factory? Where it is? Why is that there? Who is involved? What volumes? What people? Even you know what sort of personalities are negotiating uh, these things? And this is to me is uh, of greater significance than uh, simply stating the fact that there is something something going on. One more thing that I would like to say is that the both states are actively participating in these online media. Activism, you know, both have at least in Iran. I know there is an official budget in it, exceeding a billion dollar, and what we call in Iran as a cyber army. That you have like this army of people going to Twitter and making fake accounts and try to be propaganda of regime, or indirectly or even indirectly. What surprised me, like a couple of years ago when I came outside the country, that the perception of Iran is like a huge military power powerhouse industrial but but while living there i've never saw such a thing they cannot even make a good car they cannot make a, even you know there's no infrastructure and how can they make like these uh sci-fi uh, technology things so i think both states russians also actually are famous for that as well that they are you know f fueling these uh this uh, idea and this media as well because you know for them they have also this idea of any publicity is a good I would have maybe a question to Ariane right away. Don't you, Ariane, think that it, uh, this you know, media coverage or like the image is actually beneficial to the hardliners in the Iranian government, which I'm very happy to hear that uh, everyone is against them and they are the ones like the salvation people who are standing against the global injustice. And uh, yeah. Yeah, Exactly. Right now, if you search uh, like this Shahed uh, 136 in Farsi, the first headlines that you will see that, that there are for sure, you know, governmental websites. What you see is like Iranian drones are the best in the world. You know, West is trying to copy our technology. So you see that whatever they are doing is just using the same coverage first for the internal use mostly. And second, just to make this perception that they are something. While in my opinion, they're not. Yeah, it's almost like um, I think the Iranian government has been using footage from Ukraine um, of um, drone attacks in order to promote its technologies. I mean, they're exploiting every single chance they get um, to showcase, you know, the asymmetric warfare capabilities that they developed. And I mean, it's working, honestly. Um, you, we cannot dismiss the utility of um, the um, the strategy that Iran has pursued for decades and developed these technologies for quite, you know, low price in comparison to the Western alternatives. And nevertheless, yes, they, you know, Russia and Iran both are known for, you know, blowing things out of proportion and inflating their capabilities and putting, you know, um, paper tigers um, trying to pretend that they are real animals. Even in, in that sense, when we were talking about the drones in Ukraine, for example, like, uh, and, and we talk about the relation, for example, it would be more identifiable if they had a better relation that the drones had been used in a in a better way in Ukraine. Like there's many reports that the the um, the assimilation of drone warfare onto other units of the Russian uh, military hasn't actually been done properly in the in the field, and so uh, like they're basically not assembling their forces in an efficient way. So they're like dropping the drones into civilian areas, or like yes, you can try and disrupt some. Um, some electric electric rig or or some stuff, um, basically civilian purpose uh, infrastructure, but you haven't actually been able. Although Iran has a history of using drones 
uh, since the since the 80s uh, since fighting uh, uh, against Iraq and then in the Middle East uh, like those 200 people that allegedly have been trained in in Iran I don't know exactly what are they doing with with the drones like yes okay they found a a cheaper uh, alternative to their to their million uh, missiles that they're using to to like to try and aim into into civilian infrastructure, but they haven't been able to put to get as much benefit from it as you could expect. And that information, in case you will have a better relation, in case you will have a strategic partnership, in my opinion, that's kind of in the situation that we're living right now. It should be. The first thing you have to do, first thing you have to do is let's make this efficient. And apparently that exchange of information hasn't taken place. So that also gives a little bit of an idea of what is the kind of relationship that they both have. Let's speak about drones a bit deeper. And uh, I have the first implication or, or the first subtopic. I was watching a documentary yesterday and they said the Caliber missile using by Russians is around $1 million. The Tomahawk, the American equivalent is around $2 million. And Shahid drone is $20,000. So how do you understand that some people claim that this collaboration with Iran from the Russian side is purely based on the economic calculation to use the cheaper technology and to save the Russian technology for later. What do you think about this? I would have to comment uh, right away. Uh, this is a, uh, an alternative in, uh, let's say, the process of re-modernizing the equipment and like advanced uh, weaponry systems. However, why these cheap solutions are being used is uh, I have actually looked up some data on uh, the historical usage of uh, drones by the Russian military. And uh, in 2008, during the, uh, the the clashes with Georgia, Russia used uh, drones that were produced in 1980s, and since then the technology didn't really advance. There was no there was a mistrust from uh, officials of the Ministry of uh, Ministry of Defense, uh, and uh, I'd say no political will to invest into those technologies because domestic production would cost significantly higher than uh, getting there from getting them from abroad. However, uh, imagine the scale and how much resources and money you need to uh, make this reverse engineering work in. It's not that just you buy one, one drone, you just dismantle it and you put it on the, on the construction belt and in, in two minutes it's ready. Uh, it's just, it didn't, didn't really uh, work, work this way. And uh, the 20,000 drones is a great alternative to, uh, obviously, you know, to uh, cause uh, additional damage to the Ukrainian infrastructure. Uh, and second of all, it's um, it's a great opportunity for Iran also to see how this technology might be com tested in uh, in combat and perhaps then modernized. Speaking then of the factory, which allegedly has to be operational in the beginning of next year and possible expansion of its production capabilities and already re replacement of certain components which, which come from abroad, which uh, it might potentially lead to development of more advanced uh, systems that will be then jointly used by those uh, bad guys in the international system. And we yeah, don't know actually, where this technology might go, uh, like uh, afterwards, after, after that, beyond, beyond the border. Correct, correct, me, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, as far as I understand, the, and I'm sorry for my pronunciation of Sahed, um, these drones. Uh, when uh, like it's the center of um, the center of armament, <clears throat> the conflict armament research, uh, the CAR. Like when they were doing the reverse engineering to these drones that they found in Ukraine, basically eighty percent of the components uh, were not available anymore because they are within the sanctions for both countries. Um, when we're talking about this capability that uh, Russia made, like this uh, factory, uh, are we talking now? Um, drone production in in russia mm, you really need to change many components of the of the drones and as you were uh, uh, rightly mentioned igor like russia has not actually developed this these technologies and like the engines of the drone come from germany the vis the visor comes from the us like really even if you manage to set up the factory first the product that you're going to be producing is not tested 
because you're not doing what you were, what you had before. You had to do something new. Second, how long will it take to, for that to actually take place? There's another two projects of uh, drones in Russia in the beginning of uh, in this century. Uh, one is uh, uh, is an attack, um, um, it's an attack drone that, that got delayed two or three years in the in the delivery. There was another project that got delayed almost a decade. Like I don't really understand. Um, maybe you can help me here but i don't really see how can they uh, create how can russia create a production of drones out of nowhere with no intel um, based on the iranian part which is also with western components although some of them have been replicated but it's still not fully independent it's still not fully uh, self-sufficient like neither of both countries well um to kind of add to that um i think that we greatly overestimate the sophistication how sophisticated these drones are uh some of them are just suicide drones with yes they can um i think they can fly more than thousand miles um and uh, fly low enough to not be detected by most um um anti anti-missile or um air defense systems um but in many ways iran was capable of either reproducing as you said or finding ways to acquire uh, those Western technologies that, you know, um, Iran was sanctioned for, you know, decades, and it has developed ways and, you know, pathways to um, acquire these, um, these dual use items. And I'm sure that the know-how and the, you know, the routes of acquiring those items were, are shared and have been shared with Russia. Um, and you can see um, with the uh, South Caucasus and former Soviet Union republics um, eagerly or companies there eagerly participating in, um, you know, gray area dual use exports to Russia. Um, I'm sure that um, the Russian state has invested a lot of money throughout uh, 2022 to develop those capabilities. And that is why actually it used to buy or is buying Iranian drones and mass during um, 2022 year, specifically because it couldn't produce their own drones um, at the time. I'm sure that the, the production rates will increase by 2025. I think they announced um, amount is about 6,000 uh, drones by 2025, um, which, you know, you can believe it or not, um, and I'm sure it is inflated, but the fact is that they did invest um, in um, the drone technology because it was an urgency, because it's such an asymmetric advantage over the Ukrainian um, posture, specifically because it's centralized, unlike in Ukraine. I just want to go back to the, the original discussion around the caliber cruise missiles versus the drones because i think to compare them they're not exactly like for like obviously um and they'll be used for different purposes so i think as i said russia is developing the drone technology but that's in addition to still producing caliber uh class cruise missiles which obviously are much more expensive to produce you can produce 50 drones or purchase 50 drones from Iran for the same price as one cruise missile so that's why they're able to expand them on just mass attacks on civilian infrastructure kind of without any regard for exactly where the drones land um because technologically wise they're much more rudimentary than the cruise missiles they don't have much control over them they're much they're, they're actually quite easy to be shot out of the air if so then you have to run run the operation on a mass scale to try and just see whatever can get through the defense system um to hit so in that sense, they're, they're, they're operating on very different uh, levels of capability. And then um, it's kind of maybe a stopgap while they, they really don't have the resources, I think, to keep producing the caliber cruise missiles while they're currently continuing fighting. So they're just trying to fill that gap and keep pressure on Ukrainian infrastructure um, by using the drones. So I think, yeah, when we think about it, they got a lot of press early on in the war because there was we saw the big attacks on civilian infrastructure but since there's the anti-air defense systems have been delivered they've been much less effective at actually hitting targets within ukraine we still see some drones get through every day and hit but they're they're not capable of doing anywhere near the damage as they were at the start when drones on mass were falling down on kiev so i think people then got this idea in their head that drones were going to fully change the war and win the war for russia and i just don't think that that's necessarily the case at all i think their capability is now often thought of as much higher than that that it is in reality. Yes, just what um, sorry, go sorry. ahead, go ahead, Arian. 
I think Russia has a bigger, bigger aim than drones itself, which is dragging another country into the conflict, which can use it as a leverage in the international arena. And I think it was really successful in that matter. I don't believe that Islamic Republic authorities were actually willing to participate like openly in the Ukraine war. But now they, they they are accused of being being and they are actually doing that. But I think in the bigger picture, that was a really good game played by Russia just to include another country in as as her ally there. And on the other hand, you know, these drones, they don't have a technology. You know, the, the basements of drones, maybe you, you know it also, they, they are a copy of an Israeli version, Harpy, that they found in Israel in, in Syria a few years ago, and they first start to use the uh, Shahed in, in Aramco, if I'm not mistaken, and Yemen. So the technology is really easy. It's 200 kilograms, and the head of it is 50 kilograms. It's best thing for just a kamikaze attacks, as it is doing. Especially, yeah. it has a psychological effect because it has a large sound, and it's if you talk to the Ukrainian people with the like uh, experience and uh, you know witnesses, they said that it's. It makes like a huge terrified sound and stuff like that. But in practice, I think for for Islamic Republic, this is also uh, a good game somehow for them because they see it, see it as a like a recognition in the international arena that hey, we are actually producing something, which in my opinion, it's it's not that special. But the real winner is is Russia in this in this case because they are getting something cheap. They are not giving that much uh, back, and they are bringing uh, an ally to on, on their side. And I think they are winning more by having that as an ally than the drones itself. I would just like to say just on that. Um, I I understand Russia might be trying to drag another country into the conflict. However, Iran has been always publicly denying that they're supplying drones, um, so that they can kind of use it as leverage. For the West, they're just trying to play their own strategic advantage. I think they're not publicly aligning with Russia at all, um, even though that might be what Russia wants to do by tying them in with this program. Uh, well, they have these drones; they can set, still have some level of plausible deniability that the regime is directly supplying Russia. Yeah, just to your point, Ron, on, on that you mentioned um, a couple of minutes ago, it's basically an attritional approach where Russia recognizes that replenishing the stockpiles of more sophisticated equipment or more traditional sort of military equipment is much more complicated. Um, it will it will take a lot more time. Um, and in the meantime, um, focusing on asymmetric capabilities developed by Iran and improved, routinely improved by Iran for years, um, it's easier than trying to come up with your own um, sophisticated or effective drone technology that we can see that Shahed drones are much more capable than Russian alternatives or at the time of the conflict um, when the conflict started. So definitely it is an advantage, but in the long run, what will matter is traditional military technology and, um, you know, Russia's um, lack of capacity to maintain the attrition. We spoke about drones and we, we, we basically investigated how Iran contributed to, to the conflict by delivering the drones. But my question is, what can Russia offer to Iran in exchange? Because uh, I have a little report here that they delivered some cash, they delivered some Western weapons that they, they size in Ukraine. And and that's okay because this is the money question. You know, money question is 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 understandable. But I'm interested in what more can Russia offer to Iran to sustain this relationship? Well, um an obvious go to would be Russian aircraft. Um in 2017, um Iran requested or well, there was some rumor of a deal uh, for Su 35s. Russia obviously ended up not supplying them because it was wary of high, techno high technology arms sales to Iran, specifically with its, because of its relations with the West that um, had not been that bad um, as right now. Um, and second, because it wanted to keep the Iranian government in check because it, they were not strategic allies and they were not aligned everywhere. Um, see, now, I think there were reports that those um, Su-35s were delivered um and uh, transferred to iran i'm not sure about the validity but the fact is that iran has more leverage to request more high-tech technology um high-tech military uh, equipment from russia 
And also, you know, as you, like you just said, the F30, uh, SU-35s are super advanced technology and uh, it's unclear how the West would react to that. And especially uh, the, in, the globe, in a broader Middle Eastern context, how Israel would react and how Israel would definitely not welcome such a step. And uh, that would perhaps shift uh, Israeli uh, ongoing, very diplomatic stance into participating or not in the conflict, in the war. And it was to change the balance of power in the region uh, drastically. I would go a little bit on to uh, what was mentioned before on the, like, I, I think Iran may be getting, the benefit that Iran is getting also is a, a recognition in the international arena. To the end, it's been uh, locked for many years now. Uh, with regards of how can this particular thing with the with the planes that Russia may be providing to to Iran, I don't really think they would be a massive game changer in the Middle East. To be fair, uh, Israel and Saudi Arabia also will have access to the F 35s so uh, you also have access to the latest technology. Uh, whether if it works or not, because they haven't been tried, tried, uh, tested. Uh, so uh, I don't think it will be that much of a difference. Plus, uh, we're talking of Iran, of a country that has had a massive inflation in the last year, uh, which economy, you know, like, for example, I am of the thought that one of the reasons for the rapprochement between Iran and Saudi Arabia has to do with Iran going through a massive economic crisis and needing to find sources of income. Uh, because they really are uh, struggling in that sense and they cannot really keep up with uh, Saudi or well, obviously Israel is a different example, but cannot really keep up with Turkey, for example, although Turkey has uh, a massive inflation too. So um, I would go more for um, the benefit that Iran may be getting from Russia is that it may be getting some material or technology that otherwise would have to be paying for. And right now, would not have the, the capacity to pay for that technology. And uh, in exchange, well, they send the drones. And uh, as was mentioned also, you have the expert, like you test the drones on the ground. Uh, when, the conflict, when the conflict in Ukraine ends, uh, you can sell these drones elsewhere because they've been proven they're cheap. You can turn your eyes into Africa. You can turn your eyes into Southeast Asia. Uh, literally, you can sell them to anyone. It's a really appealing product. So uh, as as uh, I mean, Ariane has mentioned that, well, the quality and so on, it's not the best. Still, it's really cheap for, for certain actors in the rest of the world. I think the most Iran is getting from this is an extra option in the negotiation tables. As right now, we can see they don't have that much of leverage in any negotiations. The internal situation is, is really bad. The economy is, is, is devastating. Protests are going on. So the regime is really fragile there in Europe. So what keeps them up is temporary actions. As, as we, if we see Iran's uh, politics in the last 40 years, they don't have you know, long-term aims or long-term gains. They, they want to just survive. And I think right now they're betting on the U.S. elections of next year. They are they want to gain as much as they can before before some other Republican or Trump comes again, and they want to take the full advantage of you know current Biden administration, which they are. I think the current deal, getting money for the prisoners that are not even willing to go back to Iran right now. It it's a perfect example of that. And the drones also is a, I think Russia is not getting anything to Iran basically because Russia doesn't want a powerful Iran with the technology or that much thing. They want just a weak ally, kind of vassal state, let's say. So I think Iran is playing this game just to have like an extra leverage on the Western countries so they can kind of go out of the radar and, and then have something to get uh, in return. Um. Yeah, Arian, um, I wanted to also point out that um, definitely the, I think we have, we just passed a year after the Kurdish woman was killed in Iran that sparked the protest. Um, and this definitely has been one of the most volatile moments and or years for the regime. So they are struggling to um, gain legitimacy from abroad, not only from the economic perspective. Uh, the other point that I wanted to mention is that there is a drone market. Uh, global drone market, and there are new players in that drone market. Um, Iran is trying to enter it with a bold move of, you know, portraying that its drones are capable of um, being not on the same level, but 
um, actually competing with Western style um, air defense systems and oftentimes being effective. Um, of course, they don't mention that there are not so many or there were not so many uh, air defense system in Ukraine to begin with. Um, but uh, let's leave it at that. But the other thing that I kind of wanted to throw out there is um, what do you think of Iran being invited to join um, or being actively um, um, being actively supportive of joining the BRICS? Um, it definitely is not a Russia, uh, Russia-led initiative um, where China has more leverage, but still the idea of Iran being a more important, not only a regional, but a player that has to be heard is there. Um, it tries to amplify not only its regional geopolitical influence, but also diplomatic clout. Uh, I can say that they are trying to just find a better chain to grab in order to survive. The reason for that is if we, if we follow like the past two years that they first signed the deal with China and then after the protests going on in Iran, they just suddenly become like not friends, like, like they neutralize their problems with Saudi Arabia for short term. So I can see in the, that perspective that they are not following to a way to become like a global superpower or anything close to that. They want to just find like alternative ways. But BRICS is, is something that they applied for it even before. And they and also the Shanghai uh, uh, agreement as well, a few months prior to that. So they are selling it, although no one is that much buying the idea inside the country. But Outside, they are thinking that, okay, Iran is surviving somehow, is helping others, and, and it's getting powerful. But I think outside the media, in practice, as Martin said, there's nothing happening. You know, even the deal with China, if we see the, the first year of the deal, the entire investment of China was less than 500 million. So I think if that deal is ending up like that, BRICS wouldn't go anywhere. Uh, oh, yeah, i just like to say in Britain, all the talk of BRICS, uh, I feel like their influence in public opinion is much greater than their actual strength together. They're a very divided organization. If you look at the constituent countries, they don't want to trade with each other. Their, their own goals are almost impossible for them to achieve in terms of a unified currency or even the trade between them is, is still much, much reduced compared to trade with other people. So I think the, it shouldn't be putting too much uh, weight on the bricks. And, and just to go back to what uh, Mikhail said before about uh, looking that there is like now a much more competitive drone market. We see Turkey has been entering the, the fold in terms of they've been scaling up massively drone production and they've actually um, signaled to Ukraine that they will build a factory within Ukraine. Or I think they might have already started building that. And Turkey's obviously stayed quite neutral throughout the whole war. So I think it's not necessarily ideological um, to, to go out and then start producing the drones. I think it's it comes down to finances and money at the end of the day. If you think you've got a competitive advantage, you can put it on the global marketplace and say, look, it's proven in battle, then that's an advantage for Iran. And when they've got other Middle Eastern competitors also growing rapidly, they want to try and seize on any advantage they can get, I think. So Russia is the largest country in the world. Why Russia doesn't have drones as a, as a stream of a military uh, sort of like supplies and, and and a military power that's the first question the second question we are reading about the factory being built or maybe it's already operating we don't have much information about it but it's in russia it's supposed to be between kazan and ufa somewhere in the uh, Yela Buga or whatever is the name of the town, but this is not confirmed at the, at the moment. But we know that Iranians and Russians are working on a factory which would be in Russia, and this factory will produce more and more drones. And my question is: so you know, you know that there is some sort of conflict, you know, behind the border. And during 10 years, you don't have any supplies of drones, you were not thinking about establishing this factory earlier. Or was the cause of that that in 2023 we reading about a Russian Iranian factory for drones being placed or located in Russia? Why is it that? I mean, I think we can all agree that the Russian invasion to Ukraine has been a massive disaster from the strategic and preparation perspective. Uh, there was a special military operation that is supposed to last a few days, tops, couple of weeks. Uh, we are on the second year of the of the war. 
it's not looking good for at this point for neither of the, the contenders. Like it's also not looking good for Ukraine to be fair. Um, but it's uh, honestly like when you see the development of it, it, for me, it's day after day. I'm more of the idea that it will lead to a stalemate, and that is something that enters. Why didn't they have? Why didn't the Russians have uh, more drone preparation? Where he was has mentioned before that uh, there was some drone production uh, in the in the war with Georgia, uh, but that there was not a trust in the in the Russian ranks in the higher ranks of the military to produce them. I mean, honestly, uh, everyone thought that Russia was the second best military or or some of the best military of the world uh, in 2022. Uh, if it's the best military of the world, we will have to see the rest. Or the second best, we will have to see the rest. Because clearly there's been some lack of preparation. And I mean, also, uh, as far as I understand, the the... For example, the ammunition that Russia is using right now in Ukraine is ammunition that it's not currently being produced. It's ammunition that has been stored for the for the past uh, thirty years, twenty years, and uh, it's ammunition that uh, Russia and maybe you can correct me here, but Russia still doesn't have the capability to replenish its own ammunition. And in the beginning of the war, I remember that they started uh, they changed a little bit the production in certain spots to 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 catch up with how much was being spent in Ukraine. So I don't find it that weird that uh, Russia wouldn't have the, a drone factory or whatever. They didn't think they would need it. Uh, we're going to enter Ukraine. Like they're going to open the, they're going to open the borders and they're going to come and hug us. This is just like, this was a rhetoric even before the invasion, even during the invasion. So and one, one, just one more step of the massive mismanagement that the, is the Russian military. Perhaps here we come to the point of strategic interests, because um, let's say if you strategically develop an, an ICBM, it looks in the headlines, it looks more scary than uh, an army of small drones or something which, which carry not a lot of not a lot of explosives. And uh, I mean, what will uh, the main question is that, you know, why uh, the factory is built, that what is going to be there eventually? And what would be with that factory uh, after the war? Well, obviously, uh, I don't think that uh, this factory will be used only for handicraft production or like maybe some industrial, you know, um, uh, industrial capability of producing like tens, maybe tens of thousands of these, of these ones. Um, they will, you know, obviously go deep in all all components of these drones and replace details and like try to modify them and especially if this will be done by, uh, in uh, under the surveillance of Iranian experts which are we've been visiting those facilities or if they're permanently stationed there or how this is going to be developed in future uh, it is unclear and the potential of that uh, military technological cooperation we can't even estimate what uh, how that will look like because we don't even sim simply have the data we don't know what uh, this factory can be will be able to to produce at the end of the day since the, the drones are as we said they they prove to be effective like on only on mass scale with the limited presence of um, uh, anti-missile complexes so this for now is a big question and uh, why the drones haven't been developed in Russia before or, or it was part of my initial point that there was no interest and no trust in the in the Russian military itself and uh, second of all uh, once there is such a huge human potential why do you need to invest in something sophisticated if you have unlimited manpower resource um yeah just to echo yeah, um, just to echo Igor's point, um, also, yes, we talked about Russian um, lack of preparation, but I also, we also need to mention that Russian strategic posture, Russian military doctrine did not include drones as an important pillar. And in fact, many military doctrines disregarded drone technology um, of, you know, relying on drone technology and mass. Um, if something, it was an act of desperation or sort of an immediate urgency to implement drone technology because of the lack of um, um, other traditional or the diminishing diminishing numbers of other traditional military equipment that Russia possessed. That's one thing. And then generally, 
um, the Russian military st structure has always been bad with command and control. And drone technology, as far as I'm aware, also involves quite a lot of communication um, and reliance of on um, sophisticated and um, um, enabled um, enabled individual units. Um, so for Russia, artillery has always been a major part instead of the drone technology. When it's running out, there is an immediate need to replace um, the artillery shells with cheap drones. Um, and yeah, rather than a strategic posture, it was an act of desperation and immediate need. Yeah, that was basically going to be my point as well. I think that the Russian military doctrine and their overall strategy didn't include it at all. They their focus for the last 10 years of stockpiling has been on small arms ammunition and artillery shells for this war of attrition that they could thought they could overcome any problem by throwing enough bodies at it. And so this failure in in Ukraine has called had made them call into question their own military doctrine. I would think I'm not part of the the discussions within the military the Russian military, but they they must be thinking like this is, we need a new approach. This has not worked against a, an enemy that has one tenth the manpower, and obviously at the start of the conflict had one tenth the the level of sophisticated technologies at its disposal. Now that's obviously different, but yeah. So I think it, in going forward, they're going to incorporate it into their military doctrine, which is why they're building the factory to to look towards the future. But it was definitely just an oversight, and I don't think it was unique, but just with the Russian military. Obviously, the US has very sophisticated drones, but they don't produce these cheap drones on mass. I think for for warfare, they produce very high technology precision drones, um, which have a completely different use case, and they also didn't necessarily see the the use case for huge amounts of um, low cost, dumb, unintelligent drones that could just be dropped on on targets without any sort of sophistication. And maybe just to add to that, Russia has not experienced a conflict with a military of a, not comparable, but a sophisticated military for a while. Um, it didn't need the drone technology. It had enough sort of missile technology or general artillery to, you know, to satisfy the demands of conflicts that it participated in. And it much preferred leveling um, or making the rubble um, bounce, the rubber bounce um, in conflicts that it participated in Chechnya um, and specifically in Syria as of lately. So the, when there is no demand, <laughs> there is no supply. Let's let's do some simulation as, as the last part of, of this uh, podcast or episode. And I have two scenarios. The first one, the war in Ukraine will end up in five months. The second scenario, the war in Ukraine will end up in 15 months. How would you assess the quality and development of the Russian-Iranian military relations? I mean, it depends on the, the outcome of the war, not the duration, I think. I mean, if, if Russia is forced out of the occupied territories and, you know, become a, like an absolute loser, that can be a, a really, I mean, different outcome that just compromising each other with some, something, giving Kerigma and like some other places. Yeah, I will actually build up a little bit into what Arian just said. Uh, so in my opinion, if uh, you have a if the war finishes in five months, that is either absolute uh, absolute uh, defeat of Russia or absolute defeat of Ukraine. I don't see a negotiation happening within five months that would be fruitful and would lead to a ceasefire or a peace deal. Uh, given the circumstances now, uh, there's not even an agreement for the grain deal. Uh, it's. Uh, I think we're in like really antipodes right now in, in diplomatic measures. If it lasts 15 months, uh, I'm still out of the idea that uh, that uh, interconnection between um, Iran and Russia will will increase in in strategic in strategic stuff that Russia may need. If uh, they need something that uh, Iran Iran may have, or if Iran, for example, within these 15 months. Uh, this rapprochement with uh, with uh, Saudi Arabia and uh, this reshuffling a little bit of the alliances of the Middle East actually comes to a place, which is questionable. Uh, how will that develop? 
uh, we will have to add that to the table and we will have to have that maybe Iran doesn't have a problem in its immediate neighbor neighborhood as uh, we may perhaps perceive last year. Um, so if it's in the short term, if it's in five months, I don't think this will develop much longer. I think it will just develop for the necessity and it's the needs and period. If it's 15 months, uh, I would say the the need of Russia to have a reliable source of uh, ammunition weaponry, even as Ariam was mentioning, someone else in the international system that supports you. Um, and the need of the Islamic Republic of uh, some validator with their economic situation, because I think that's what the, the social situation is already bad in the country. But I think the economic situation may be just the, the cherry on top. And uh, so they will both uh, they will both find a way of helping each other because they really don't have many more options. <laughs> and their market is pretty close right now. Yeah, well, either just, way, copper. Yeah, go ahead. I, I was just going to say just on that. I think a lot of it will depend on the outcomes of maybe Iran's reintegration with the West. As we said just today, this deal that's been in the works for a while has been finalized to unblock $6 billion of Iranian funding from South Korea, which was brokered and, and agreed by the US. Uh, at the same time, just last week, the UK, France and Germany rejected softening of sanctions against the Iranian regime because of the fact that the, the terms of JCPOA were not being met and because there were still uh, restrictions on nuclear inspectors and because there was still evidence of enriched uh, uranium enrichment program. So if Iran was to come back and get back to the negotiating table, which I think that they, they, they're wanting to with the West, then they would have much less of a need to be, uh, to be with Russia. And uh, as we started, I think there's no ideological love between the two countries. It's more, it's more, um, just the world situation at the moment that's brought them together. So if Iran was given other options, I think that either way, depend, doesn't matter how long the war goes on, Iran could be drawn away from Russia regardless. Yeah, uh, exactly. That would be more or less my point as well, with no regards how much, how much time longer the war will be ongoing. The cooperation between Russia and Iran will be ongoing. Depend, but However, there is one factor. Uh, Iran the West can offer so many things to Iran and uh, exchange of prisoners and like, re-freezing of the assets is just one of the things. Uh, and this will just depend on what the West will be willing to offer uh, Iran, because Iran also has something to bargain. Say there were talks of supplying uh, short-range ballistic missiles to Russia, but that was met, uh, but that was commented as a very unfavorable red line for the West, because then Iran would have severe or uh, greater economic and politic political pressure. So uh, Iran is rationally exploiting the situation as for its to maximize its benefits in a very limited uh, limited space for maneuvering. And uh, Russia has not much options because otherwise uh, it has no capabilities to adequately adequately keep doing what they're doing. And for many years, it wouldn't be there. So, uh, the tr the train the train you know how much how much money you need to carry to to spend that train all <laughs> over that like eight thousand kilometers and exactly that shows the level of desperation within Russia in my opinion at the moment yes I mean if not even China is supplying you like, because I assume that the Russians expect China to at one point supply and stuff but it's not even a, a good game for China <laughs> uh, you're literally like they were rebuying. Uh, I don't know if this was confirmed in the end that there was this talks of like rebuying Indian aircraft that was previously sold by the Soviet Union to India and then Russia rebuying them. So it's like really old equipment. I mean, we're talking that if you don't have the capability to build what you need, you need to find it somewhere else. And literally right now, you really have few options. I mean, and few better than Iran because you already have some technology over there. So, yeah, I, mean, I think we'll kind of go ahead. I mean, just for the sake of simulation, I can see two possible outcomes. In five months, if war is going to end, it's not going to end in the Russian favor. I don't think so. If it's going to be in the short term, probably, I don't know. I know that development with the counteroffensive is not going as predicted in Ukraine, but the other things can happen within, within Russia and, and also within Iran. 
they can be some internal conflicts or something or some something brings brings Russia to the negotiation table in the inferior position. In that case, I think huge uh, changes will happen. But in a more probable thing, in the 15 months, we're going to have the U.S. presidential elections that I think Iran can, it, it cannot bet on a, another Democrat in the office. So they will see that probably another harsh Republican will come. So they will try to, you know, take the distance from Russia in the long term, just in case be ready for the dealing somehow with the more harsher person in the White House. So in the long term, I think it's the deterioration is foreseeable in the both relationship. And I think they are both probably betting for what's happening in the, the election and, you know, acting appropriately. Um, I think as we kind of um, outlined, Iran has a short window of um, increased leverage over Moscow and it tries to exploit it as much as possible. Um, and given the fact that, you know, the transfer of that drone technology is not going to be a long term uh, partnership, um, the Russians will eventually, and as inefficient as the machine is, um, learn how to produce those drones in mass, um, get to know this know how, and um, Iran's new gained leverage will be diminished back. Um, not to maybe previous levels, um, but still um, it will not have the upper hand um, in these negotiations. And as we all kind of rightly mentioned that there are also elections in um, the United States, there are many factors in play and also um, why the war ends. Is it a military uh, induced or like attrition reduced, uh, induced um, cessation of armed hostilities or it's a diplomatic political um, ending? Um, too many ifs, as um, Igor, I think, said in the beginning, and uh, too many unknowns to actually be confident here. The last question for today, for all of you. And uh, I came across this question like three, four days ago when I was uh, discussing Iran and Russia with a few experts. And we were debating a possibility of Iranian soldiers or, let's say, private military people from Iran coming to Ukraine as Wagner Group was operating in Ukraine. Do you think that this might be a possibility or Iran will basically say, no, we will only be supplier of the drones, but we won't send any people to Ukraine? I mean, what's the benefit? Um, if Russia can hardly supply anything, or not hardly supply, but um, if Russian items uh, that Iran seeks to acquire or Russian offer is limited, um, a more involved engagement of Iran will require more dedication from Moscow. And I'm just curious to see what other things there are uh, Moscow that Moscow can offer that are better or more desirable than Western offers. So that's my question. Plus, Iran, um, I think um, Ariane knows more on, on this, but Iran is maybe struggling domestically. Um, and the potential trained um, loyal force is, you know, it's needed at home, not um, in Ukraine. But what Iran can do, actually, is using its proxy groups for that. That's a foreseeable thing, actually. You know, they have militias in, in, in Iraq, in, in Syria, in Hezbollah, maybe. I mean, if, if they're going to do it, they won't do it directly as, as they really, they are really cautious about this to directly involve. They, they prefer to do it under different names. So I think in the best case scenario, I mean, best case scenario for Russian perspective, Putin perspective, I would say Iran can just in exchange for something more valuable, send some of these proxy militias under something, you know, like Fatimians or Hashto Shabi or others to them. Maybe they will just, the uh, Iranian side will just send some sort of like instructors because what, how many soldiers can, can you send? Or like how many paramilitants can you send? Or like how many radicals can you send? And what sort of the price you, uh, one has to pay for such a very unclear, uh, unclear deal. So do, do these guys, do, does, does Russia is gonna pay for the cannon fuller? Or that would be something that we will just not know from uh, from the media. But strategically, maybe some instructors can go. But this is perhaps the red line, even for Iran as well. Even considering that they, uh, there are many proxies and they also can be used as a human resource. But the risks, geopolitical risks, are too high to be that engaged. 
yeah, I agree. I think the political cost for Iran is too high for them to want to get involved in any significant way with troops on the ground. Uh, and as as Mikhail pointed out, they've got their own internal security problems, which have been ongoing for a year now, which have mostly been quashed, but the, the undercurrents of the the original protests are still there. They still flare up from time to time. And I think the regime has been um, particularly strong in clamping down because of their own vulnerability, I think. So they wouldn't be willing to lose any of their well-trained troops. Then whether they send the militias, like Arian said, maybe, but that's not really in their control, I think. The militia groups have usually have other motives that drive them and other financial other financial um things to gain from from external external illicit smuggling routes and drug trades and things like this which they wouldn't necessarily trade away for to go serve on the front lines in ukraine and be used as cannon fodder basically exactly i think uh, uh for even for russia uh some like the militias would be better off helping securing uh, the illicit trade lines uh, which they already do in the Middle East. Uh, so transferring them to Ukraine, like Iran doesn't have to be directly involved. Like maybe they can like use some militia in the Middle East already existing that they may have some grievances with some of the groups in Ukraine. I mean, uh, Russia has done it and uh, with Islamist groups and, and, and both in the side of Ukraine and Russia. So you can always call upon these, uh, these um, grievances that they may have. But what is the benefit? <laughs> I agree with everyone, to be honest. I think we, in this one, we're pretty, we pretty much agree there's not much benefit for, for neither of them. And just imagine, I mean, you already have a problem with the military. Now you bring people that don't even speak the language and everything. Another, mil, para, another parallel group in the, I don't know, find it uh, way too complicated and uh, the, the results are not that clear. You know, um, just to kind of add a layer to it, uh, when we talk about Russian mercenaries and like the Wagner Group, as well as other um, private military companies in Ukraine, yes, they are being paid. But the type of a person to join this type of an organization to begin with um, must be either um, um, motivated not only by money, pretty much. In many ways, they're actually aligned ideologically with um, the premises of um, this war. So having someone from abroad with the only motivation to get financial resources is risky. Um, it's ris it's risking um, military strategy. It's risking general motivation with other troops. And potentially, I mean, it's a small part, but the image at home, if uh, these facts are, you know, uncovered and, you know, suddenly there are these motivated pro uh, DPR, LNR, um, Iranian uh, volunteers who um, decided to leave their country to fight for Russian interests in Ukraine. Um, I don't know how that will fit into the general propaganda narrative on uh, saving the Russians by the hands of Iranians. I mean, it's a small fraction of uh, the whole equation, but it's something that, you know, it's interesting to point out. How would the table turns if uh, by the end of the year we have a whole division of uh, Iranians and, I don't know, North Koreans uh, fighting in the Russian side? Like, that would be really... I mean... The image of the Russian Cubans military, win. like, yes, the, the image of the Russian military, like, it would just be like, okay, then, it, it just imagine that they actually, I don't know, retake Bakhmut or something like this. Like, it would be another blow for the Russian military, again. This is something you can put on, on posters. Yes, yes, yes. Join, 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 join the brigade of the Red Banner, you know, like, <laughs> assemble. Yes, like, like, Lego, basically. <laughs> Thank you very much for for a good discussion about the uh, Russian Iranian military relations. I think, you know, when you read Aristotle, he was walking with students and debating topics. And we are also on Zoom debating the topic, which I think is one of the best way how to learn more. And even for the professors and for the students, it is the same level. You you can't you can't be in a position that you know and you don't know. But you must always be in position to critically review what you know and to be interested in what you don't know, but there are many opinions. So again, Igor, Mikhail, Arian, Juan, and Ronan, thank you very much for being on Iron Thinker. And I want to use this variety of nationalities and countries here 
and you can say goodbye in your own language. Thank you very much and see you later. Muchas gracias, Martin. Adiós. See you next time. Thank you. Thank you, Martin. <laughs>